Hey, weirdos. I would ask if you are a fan of true crime, but, well, you're listening to Weird Darkness, so <laughs> obviously you are. Well, in case you don't know about it, there's a podcast called The Generation Y Podcast. Hosts Aaron and Justin, they started the podcast even before I started mine. They started it back in 2012, and they dissect some of the craziest, most notable murders, crimes, and conspiracy theories, and here they are 10 years later, they're still at it, unraveling a new case every week. They take on some really famous, or shall I say infamous, cases like the evil genius bank robbery, the Zodiac Killer, the Tylenol murders. Man, I remember that happening when I was in school. Uh, they also cover some lesser-known cases, which I really like, because sometimes those big cases, you just get tired of every podcast touching on them. But they have a lot of cases that you've probably not heard of, like the case of Kimberly Rico, also known as the Valentine murder, where Kim takes her husband on a romantic weekend that includes a murder mystery play that she, of course, uses as a cover to murder her husband for insurance money. In fact, why don't I go ahead and just play you a quick clip of the Generation Y podcast. And while you're listening, you can follow the Generation Y podcast on Amazon Music or wherever you get your podcasts. Or, if you would rather, you can listen early and commercial-free by joining Wondery Plus on Apple Podcasts or the Wondery app, and I've linked to that in the show notes to make it easy for you. Here's a sample of the Generation Y podcast. Well, tonight we're talking about a mysterious death that happened April 14th, 2022 in Lynchburg, Virginia. And the mysterious death was of a young man named Johnny Cashman. I say young man because he's younger than me. He was 38. This was in Lynchburg, Virginia. I've never been there, but looking at photos and talking to people, it looks, Virginia looks beautiful. And that town is, you know, it's population of around 80,000. So I think it's a quaint town where you can still have a small town feel and know people around you. People help each other out. Uh, but like any town, there is crime and other elements that happen. So really, this case starts off, Justin, because Johnny's mother, Kim, she hadn't heard from him since that day. So she spoke to him on April 14th, which was in 2022, but then she hadn't heard from him for a few days. And that worried her because she was used to getting a text from him or a call every day, if not more than one. Now, with his having depression, that's always a fear, right? That maybe he's not wanting to talk to anyone or we could imagine something worse happening. Yeah. And his parents and sister, they all live in Maine, which is hundreds of miles away. So they can't just jump in their car and go visit him. It's a long distance. So they, their only communication is via phone or text. And when they don't hear from him, it's a little bothersome. Yeah. It's five days later on April 19th when Kim called the Lynchburg police department and she said, you know, I, talked to my son five days ago, but I haven't heard from him since. That is out of the ordinary. Is there any way you could check on him? And as we all know, that means if the police agree to it, that means they'll conduct a welfare check. And at 545 AM, officers go to his apartment and they knock, but no one answers the door. Now, Aaron, at 545 or anytime before 6 AM, I don't know if anyone's answering their door. I think a lot of us are going to be asleep. So that makes sense. Right. Yeah. But credit to them, they do conduct this welfare check. And then they come back several more times knocking and trying to get contact made with Johnny Cashman. Now, at 8 a.m., they get a key to the apartment. There is some concern here that because he's not answering, that maybe something has happened where he can't answer. Right. We don't know if he's unconscious or if he's not willing to answer the door or if there has been a suicide attempt. And we hope not. But they gain access to his apartment. What do they find inside? Well, according to the police, they find Johnny lying on his back on the floor. He's obviously dead. They 
see blood, puddles of blood, but they determine that there isn't any foul play. The officers do speak with Johnny's family, and they say it looked like this was an apparent medical condition that preceded his death. In other words, they don't think anyone attacked him or murdered him. His family's obviously concerned. His father is asking, was there any signs of violence? Was it a suicide or anything like that? And this is John Cashman. Yeah. And law enforcement's saying, no. It looks very natural. And they go on to ask if they think he suffered. And the police will say, no, it looks like this was pretty instantaneous, which I don't know how they would know that, but they're saying that he probably didn't suffer and uh, this was all natural. So Johnny's body is obviously removed from the home and the family's asking about an autopsy, if an autopsy is going to be done. And what do the police and uh, law enforcement say to that? Well, their response is, no, the case is closed, meaning they don't think one is necessary. And that is a thing, Aaron. I, I had to go look that up because I just assumed that autopsies were always done. Uh, but it's not generally necessary, as the internet says, if the cause of death is known, meaning if somebody's old and has a heart attack or somebody, you know, obviously has cancer or something to that effect, they say, well, there's no need for an autopsy. We can just take the body and go ahead and cremate or whatever you want to do. And the family takes law enforcement's word that there is no need for an autopsy. This was very straightforward and it was obviously a medical issue or medical emergency type of deal. So they make arrangements with a funeral home, which is located in Lynchburg, to have Johnny Cashman Jr. cremated so that they can bring his remains back to Maine, his ashes. They're having to do this all from afar because they live in Maine. So they're just making phone calls and arranging this to be done. At no point has anyone stepped foot into Johnny Cashman Jr.'s apartment. Not until April 29th. That's when Johnny's ex-girlfriend and her mother go to the apartment to get a few things. Now, we don't know her name. She has requested to remain anonymous. But she has spoken to the media, and this is what she said. Well, we open the door, and the first thing you see is an abundant amount of blood in the bathroom which is not at all what they were expecting to see, of course, right? They say that the whole floor is just covered in blood. There's blood on the counters, the sinks, the walls, and the toilet. And there's even, in other parts of the apartment, there's blood on door frames, floors, walls, windowsill, and even on a chair. And there are streaks of blood, including some that look like they were left by fingers. There you go. Just a small sample of the Generation Y podcast. And if you like what you just heard and you want to hear the rest of that episode or any of their other episodes, all you got to do is follow the Generation Y podcast on Amazon Music or wherever you listen to podcasts. And again, you can listen to it early, so get the episodes before anybody else does. And you can listen ad-free by joining Wondery Plus on Apple Podcasts or the Wondery app. And I've placed that link in the show notes for you.